I will start with one uh, getting back to, uh, to the topic of, of Swiss Asset Management Day, the game changer. Could you maybe tell me what is the game changer in your work? What makes your work now so much different than before, if not to say disruptive? What is the game changer? I'm, I'm going to be obvi obvious and, and say it is, is, is the cloud and, and really adopting a using something central, using something commodity to, uh, to do a job that is of use to your company. As I said before, uh, I worked in London for many years. I'd see legions of people maintaining servers with beepers on their, on their belts, trying to, trying to fix stuff and patch servers and all this kind of stuff. And I, You're a bank. Why, why are you spending so much money on your servers? This is something somebody else can do for you so much better, so much more cheaply, because that's what they do. Look at Rackspace, look at Amazon. They have 300,000 employees that all they do is host software. So using these things for benefit, the value add, the true value adds, like whether that's portfolio optimization, trading strategies, risk monitoring, something that you can really use the cloud to do analysis on will make you as, a, as an organization so much more efficient that you can concentrate on the fun stuff and not the, the not so fun stuff. I think everybody had automation in it. I had manual processes and uh, the same was basically automating the advisory mm -hmm. process. So automation is certainly one of the big things that drives the industry. And that's exactly I, I, what you... From my angle, the, the ability to process enormous amount of data. This is the change in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. especially in memory, not, not in your database. And with that, you can run, for example, the automation of wealth management because you can crunch a portfolio risk number for every portfolio, even in the size of an organization like a UBS, where our systems crunch in half an hour 600,000 portfolios. I think this, this is the huge change. And this is, a, this is in, in partly this change that we have all this memory available made the cloud possible. Um, and the cloud is only where you place this, but, but this, this ability that technology has enabled us to store in memory such an amount of data away from the traditional databases which are slow and, 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 and data silos, I think, is one of the game changers in technology that affects the financial industry. But would you say that the banks are able to, to handle all this, this data? I, I think so, yes. And it was the same remark that Andrew made. It doesn't make sense that all the banks will build their own data handling on top of their legacy systems. Providers will now appear, they build you a data lake that can read your legacy system, be it in the cloud or with even the institution, but there's no point that, that the bank itself assigns all the engineers to trying to sort of... Um, go down, dive into its database, and pull up the data. There's no point in doing that. There's been technology now formed that will allow you to put all the data together and then analyze them in one crunch on, on the level of memory or in, in a technology type, the Hadoop ideas, that, that you don't need to actually go down to the original legacy data core systems, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And if the banks attempt this to do it on their own, I think they will fail. It's the same story you said on the cloud. This Collecting and catching the data will come up with specialized companies. For example, companies like from the US, like Pivotal, which is a merger of, yeah. of, of stuff from, from traditional hosting EMC data to, to more mad, modern an, analytics on data. It's, it's the breaking up of the value chain. It's family. the openness of the value chain, basically. And like the, in, integrating suppliers into the way how you actually operate. Uh, or a cloud service provider, whatever it is, that's, that's the key. Yep. If you close yourself as a bank going forward and think you can do all your own, that's a very difficult <laughs> proposition. <laughs> Are there any questions in the room so far? There would be a microphone around, so we have to bring the question and the microphone together. That's happening now. Yes, please. One thing that I think is very interesting about this panel is the range of companies. You've got the, the big multinational bank of more mature startup and then a pure startup. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you guys culturally interact. It, it, it must be interesting on both sides. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll start as, as the young one here, or vaguely young. Um, 
certainly six years ago when I, when I first knocked on, on, on the door of a medium-sized hedge fund in London and they kind of went, oh, go away. Uh, about six months later, they're like, mm, cloud, mm, and so on and so forth. And then bit by bit, you know, this, I mean, our first three customers were hedge funds and, and now we have two of the 10 largest in the world. Um, the hedge funds are certainly more open to this. They're like, hey, I just want to get this job done. I don't care. I'm, I don't have hierarchies that need to decide on this. Hedge fund got it done. Then about two or three years ago, we noticed the rumblings from Amsterdam and Zurich and you know people kind of going hmm yes this cloud technology I can save money scale quicker blah 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 so we noticed that the asset managers started to reach out to us and even last year we signed one of the largest asset managers in Europe but certainly I, I call it like a gorilla playing with a kitten they don't know whether to eat it kill it or fly it around they're like hmm this is a strange beast what do I do with it and um, they're getting better at it they, they do the usual thing do I start a an innovation lab do I buy the company do I partner with them I, you know Know, they'll work some way of working together but the, that the openness is there now and that you know I have open dialogues with some of the biggest banks in the world and they come to me and say hey can we discuss what to do together and I'm like sure but uh, as I said six years ago it was definitely like mm, yeah come to us when you're a thousand people and that's certainly not true anymore. Same on our side so we are really integrating ourselves in this ecosystem we are part of Digital Zurich 2025 we have uh, launched the Swiss FinTech Innovations Association we are in Silicon Valley, so we are pretty much integrated into this environment, but that required openness uh, compared to the past. And obviously, uh, Swisscoin and other companies in Zurich we know very well, and we have regular interchanges with them too. So I think the, the, the shifting the paradigm, thinking that you can do everything yourself as a bank, which is not possible anymore, required to be open for fintech, smaller, bigger ones, uh, every size, yes, in every niche. How do you yeah. remark to that? Mm -hmm. One of the biggest hurdles we had to overcome as a company is actually to have people who make the bridge between traditional banking mm -hmm. and the tech speak, between the nerds and the IT guys. And it took quite a long until we had enough, I would say, bridge builders who speak the language of traditional finance, portfolio management, but can still put this to what we do in algorithms and technology. So this, this language barrier took quite a while. It took also a while because the banks initially, before the financial crisis, the party was actually too good. Why would you need automatization? Why on earth would a computer be better than, than a traditional portfolio manager? So on and so forth. It needed both. It needed the banks to open and go more towards our direction, and it needed us to speak a lot more bank speak than tech or nerd speak or mathematics speak. How much You were talking about opening the, yes. the value change. How much do you have to fear entrance from, from outside of the, the banking industry, like a Google bank or something like that? Well, I, I think they are the biggest threat, uh, Google, Facebook, or, or like an Apple, and we need to monitor and watch that, how we can react. Um, again, I think to isolate yourself from the life of our clients will not be a successful strategy. So rather you embrace it and think how you can be part of their ecosystem I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. Again, it comes to that point that banking alone, stand alone, it's very hard to succeed. Mm -hmm. That's at least my view. I'm, I'm not sure if actually regulation saves the banks. Regulation is so a burden that will hinder a lot of tech companies entering the field. They will enter part fields that are interesting to their business. I'm not surprised that they all take up payment systems because payment system is the ultimate marketing information for retail clients and what they buy. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure if they go further into banking, be it from loans and, and all that, because at that point they have the regulators on their back. Maybe it gets better with what Andrew is offering, but I think this is a crucial reason why banks so far were not so much touched by this tech change. But, but it is, I mean, coming out of London, it, it is changing. The regulators are coming out of their ivory towers and actually talking to normal people. So the FCA in London has a FinTech Innovation Lab. They have regular uh, sessions where they let people come in and talk to them. And they have been pretty world-beating in, in allowing new, um, new tech, or not new technology, but new forms of business. So they were the first ones to regulate peer-to-peer -to -peer lending, for example. That's now allowed. Okay, there's going to be some people that go bust because of it. But, you know, the regulators have realized as well, they need to 
get, get their act together as long as the banks and work out, hey, how do we help our industry? There's no, no point building walls around businesses because sick businesses will fail. So how do we enable new businesses to do business but keep the consumer safe? And I think that's the ultimate at the end of the day. It's all about the consumer. Keep them safe, make sure they can't make any stupid, too many stupid decisions and then everything should be fair game. And uh, you mentioned great companies in, in London like TransferWise, uh, enabling payments transfer. You've got peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending companies. This is all coming up now in the last three or four years, and that certainly isn't going to stop. But certainly the regulation is the one thing that makes a lot of people go, do I build a new Facebook for cats or do I make a payments business? <laughs> like, yeah, I'll make the easy play. So it is, it is few and far that goes to the fintech space. Are there any? Yeah. I, I could also yeah. foresee a totally different way of chopping the value chain apart. I could foresee an Uber-type company appearing, connecting client to a very good portfolio manager or wealth manager, but actually doesn't provide any wealth management services. It only has a great interface, links the industry who offers this, and Uber only connects the demand for taxis with the people who want to drive. It doesn't actually build taxi fleets or buys taxi fleets. So in this way, it builds a great interface where I can analyze my portfolio, I can pick the best, probably discretionary mandate. The system also monitors for me, makes sure that the guy stays true to the, the mandate I have him actually assigned and warns me if he this strays. And this could be done in the tech area without entering the regulation game. So, and then the banks would leave, for example, the digital client interface. And still, this company will rely on supply from the traditional finance industry. In, in, and a lot of banks will take this up because they have no clue how to win digitally clients for wealth management services. How, you are, uh, how are you tailoring your services for a bank and for an institution like Notmeg? Where are the differences from your... In, in, our, in our perspective, is exactly we don't want to do everything. So usually the old data um, layers and databases we respect. We then work together with a company like Avalok and build the interfaces to them or Finova or whatever system. So we don't touch the old data structure. We only pull out the data and the data structure. And usually the core elements, then the bank can, for example, design its own interfaces. It can design its own UIs in the iPad or the UIs for its e-banking. This is we don't touch because there you would need the, the interaction knowledge, the the design knowledge. We can, of course, help how you display your portfolio, but how do you do the actual client interaction? We have no clue on that. Um, and that's why we really sit in this business middle layer, and before and after us are other specialists that get pulled in, we work together. And that's why we are, we are focused on this, this, this core middle business layer to support portfolio advice. Are there some more questions in the room? About digitization. Here on the right, my right side is one question. Thank you. Uh, I guess this will be interpreted as a, uh, uh, you know, old question from a gray hair. Uh, and I'm sure you have all brilliant answers to the question of data security. I, I'm still a bit reluctant when it comes to data security if I would have to send up all my data to a cloud. And the recent history has shown that sometimes this might be a problem. Awesome. I, I was hoping I would yeah. get that question today. Thank you very much. Have we got two hours? Um, <laughs> calm down, calm down. Um, absolutely. The question is absolutely valid. Everybody should ask that question. We, when we get asked about it, the more people ask about it, the more we're confident that they're a good client. If people don't ask, ask us any questions, we're like, they probably need to better do do better due diligence. Um, the, the answers are, are relatively simple. As I said, Amazon does this for a living. That's all they do. They make sure their servers are the most robust, most secure, up to date. You know, if I look at most server rooms here, you've probably got some old version of Windows running with 55 security holes in it, whereas the hosting companies ensure that your servers are always absolutely up to date and your, and your, your operating system is up to date. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely, the problems are there, but you know what? My favorite story in, 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 back in London was that uh, somebody once lost some data because the cleaning lady had a key to the server room and she let herself in and put a USB stick in because she was paid to do it, or you get some black hat people that will pay people to do that. So the idea that your data center can be more secure than, than somebody does that for a living, it might possibly be true, but every system needs to be connected to the internet nowadays. There needs to be some communication flow and whatever, and as soon as you open that up, then it's fair game, and, and to be honest, I prefer that I gave that responsibility to somebody who absolutely knows what they're doing, rather than me trying to hire somebody off the street that says they're, hey, I know about data security, I'll make that happen for you. But you know, I mean, hands up who does internet banking. I mean, everybody does internet banking. It is, it is probably the most sensitive thing we can do. Our entire finances are being transferred over the internet, on my phone, on the train to Feficon, but yet I'm worried about sending a portfolio to a cloud service. Uh, so I would think in that respect, it is certainly the, the industry has to prove itself. There's the usual thing that the NSA and the CIA use the cloud now. So if the CIA is comfortable with the cloud, you should probably could be too. Um, but yet there, there, will, there, there, will, there, will always, there will always be breaches. That, that, that is part and parcel. There's been breaches since somebody stole papers off somebody's desk 50 years ago. So it's more about how the, how the organization can prove to you that they've got safeguards and they know what they're doing, um, rather than just you know, head in the sand, no, no cloud whatsoever, because you know, it will happen and you, know, you won't, as I said, won't get any added value for having your own server room in 10 years' time. There's also an organizational answer to that. For example, in the stuff we do, if you only send the portfolio, but no client names and so on, we have a key, but the key stays on your system, but the other information, stays on the cloud system. Even somebody breaks in, he sees 100,000 of portfolios with an with a identification number, but cannot link this back to the client. This, this is one thing. And also, there's a huge development on technology. IBM is working on that if you encrypt data, that actually you can calculate within the encrypted data without decrypting them. And if this is coming alive, then for my stuff, it's great, because you get encrypted data, can do the calculation, but actually never read the data. And then this goes back. So there is, there is a huge research done actually to make this ever better that even you don't need to really decrypt. And then the data is always encrypted. And it's not just encrypted on the way to the cloud and back, but it stays encrypted all the time on the cloud and you can still manipulate the data. This is one of the recent things that is, I think that made a certain breakthrough. And, and in this way, this, this security becomes, becomes then not such a concern anymore. Do you so feel that worry uh, among your clients? Yes, yes, obviously, but like for online banking, we do that since 15 years yeah. and, and highly protect our system as, as good as possible. But cyber is a big threat and a, a big thing that we need to definitely look at. Um, and, and there are solutions like the colleagues already explained. But what I truly believe, Switzerland has a unique proposition in the world to be a very safe place for digital identity and, and actually for cybersecurity, because the whole country's value is standing for that. And actually, uh, you know, you can, can make a huge business opportunity out of that and rather a problem. I truly believe selling Swissness in safety and digital can be a fantastic opportunity for the country. And we should invest a lot into that, actually, from a Is that innovation. Happens? Sort of the data yes. secrecy law. Yeah. <laughs> no, but yes, we, we, like I said, with the, with the um, innovations we do with Digital Zurich, with the um, other associations, we really look with startups into this proposition on digital identity and digital protection, which I believe will be a really, really big theme for the next years and, and, and a great opportunity for the country. Oh, there's other ways also. For example, you have data which you pre-crunch somewhere and then feed in the bank and do only the least operations in the bank. And the heavy calculations are done outside for everybody the like. That's what we do in risk systems. Instead of we get the portfolio from every bank every time, that you check, for example, suitability or MIFID, we overnight pre-calculate an enormous amount of data and send only the relevant bits and pieces to the bank. And in this way, it avoids sending portfolios all the time over the internet. So there is many clever ways to um, improve this to a higher degree. Nonetheless, no system, I believe, is safe and fail-break. But, but also, I, I think also that the more you get specialized, the better you get at that. So I would also not, we are not the expert doing anything on safety. We would rely on the Amazons or on whatever is within a client in a bank and its data security. I don't know how much convincing all that sounds. Maybe mm -hmm. you have additional questions to that topic, to secrecy. Is there one 
in the very back on my right side. I have an anecdote in the meantime that uh, one of our biggest grillings in due diligence, which took two months, really, really difficult. We passed flying colors, no problem. Uh, day one of being a client, they sent us their portfolio via email. Not a secure metal, so. <laughs> <laughs> so please, in the back. Yes, yeah, sorry, I have a little question. You said uh, that we can sell uh, Swissness, but how can we sell security of Swissness if uh, Amazon has the server? Well, I think the number one digital is really global. It has no borders. And providing solutions out of Switzerland with that touch, I think, is the cutting edge on top of it. Um, whether, you know, Amazon will build the servers also in Switzerland, we can plug on it here as well. So that's just the underlying infrastructure that actually they provide and doing really great stuff. But putting on top a digital identity is a feature or a functionality which they don't have to that extent, which I believe we can build. So it's really a two layers perspective. Amazon is building, sir. Um, uh, what's it called? Server rooms across the world. They just opened one in, in Dublin. They've opened one in Frankfurt. It's very likely they'll open one in Zurich. But as you mentioned, uh, data doesn't care whether it's in a bunker in Frankfurt or in a bunker in Switzerland. It, data is data, and it's, it's the laws around it that protect that. And in fairness, EU laws are pretty strict anyway. Um, yeah, don't want to have your data in the States, maybe, but as long as it's in Europe, you're, you're fairly safe. And if you put the, the on top, as you call it, the Swissness of ensuring that it's even safer, then you know where, where it's stored shouldn't matter too much. How is it for you, as, as not being a Swiss, this... Uh, uh, this word uh, of Swissness is that. Can you imagine something <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> with this word? Um, eating cheese and drinking uh, Felschlisch. Um, <laughs> no, uh, of course. I mean, Swiss, Switzerland has an amazing reputation for, for banking, and you know, as your top th top three things you'd ask to people in the city of London, they probably you know list mountains and Toblerones and, and banking. So you you have this heritage of doing it well and and, and so on. So I certainly think. Switzerland can and should use that uh, going forward. But, word of warning, that isn't going to cut it with the millennials. The millennials don't really care if you're a 500-year-old bank. They want to know, is your app sexy? Can I use it on the phone? You know, how do I interact with it? And that you've been around for 400 years and have so many customers, <laughs> they don't care. So watch out, use it, use it wisely, but also move with the times and update. But amazingly, they are very afraid. So uh, they still look a lot for security. security. All the surveys show that actually they want that experience, but they're also looking very, very carefully about cyber. Yeah. Are there any more questions in the, in the room? Over there? Yes, please. I have a question about the regulation. Regulation mainly says what you have to do, but never really what, um, how you have to do it. And if you especially think of the risk regulation, the, the, the frameworks are extremely diverse. So how do you handle this? Uh, good question. I mean, obviously, there's, there's multiple regulations. I mentioned some of them with USITS and AFMD and, and TD2 and so on. Uh, within every regulation, there is some part that is pure calculation. In USITS, you've got 50 investment restrictions, unlike a Glenson, um, which you have to check. And if you breach one of those, you have to tell the regulator. In the transparency directive, it's about shareholding. If you own more than 5% of a Swiss company, you have to tell a Swiss regulator. So those are all very much uh, quantitative, qualitative rules that you can check, and it is absolutely well defined what you need to do in that case, because if you go over 5% ownership of a Swiss company or of a, of a UK company, you need to send this form filled in with this data to this email address by tomorrow at 5 p.m. So if that's the part we take care of, is we will do the monitoring for you of the rules that can be checked, and if there is an action to be taken, filing a document or sending an email, we will do that as well. Of course, all the kind of soft things about does your organization do this or is your organization structured that way is, is slightly more difficult, but certainly things like MIFID 2, which has thousands of things you need to do, Amongst MIFID II is the position limit, so if you have more than a certain amount of commodity derivatives on an exchange, you need to report. That's clearly perfect for us. We can monitor that for you and warn you when you've gone over a certain limit. So we will take the bits out of the regulation that can be monitored and can be automated, uh, and the rest of the, the, the more slightly more soft stuff we'll leave to the consultants and the McKinsey's of this world to, to charge you lots of money to do. So it, it, we will take the, 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 the hard stuff that you can actually calculate away. So my view is actually looking ahead, the regulator should not give us paper anymore. They should give us access to their technology Absolutely. with the rules and, and the coding, Agreed. and we just use it. That, or or they, they delegate it to a service provider, but that should be ideal. 
20 years time, the regulators will do what we're doing, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. On a side note, um, what has been now done in, in FitLeg or MiFit2 for private client that you have to ensure whenever you change the portfolio, it's suitable and appropriate. One of the things that will hinder digital is we need desperately a digital signature on the advisory minutes, the Beratungsprotokolle. If this is not coming, I cannot do, for example, a hybrid type of consulting where the guy sits in Singapore, I show him the portfolio, we have a video link and all that, he agrees to buy the stuff, but then he needs to print the, out the thing, send it back. So p bits and pieces, you said a di di digital identity, digital signature, need to come because otherwise I can I have a break in the process where paper and the traditional stuff comes. And, and this will hinder technology greatly because a, a pure digital bank that has no offices and would only talk over Skype to you and has a very nice app and showing you thing will not work at the moment because you need to sign these damn papers. Coming to a close um, before the lunch, or there is even one more question? Yes, please. Of course. Um, to follow up on the on the prior question, how do you deal with the liabilities your clients have towards the regulator? Are they do they remain with them? How do you deal with that? I guess that's aimed at me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, that's the second best question after security. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, as I said, it, this is multiple chains of information. The regulator publishes something, maybe in Cantonese, maybe in Indonesian, that our legal counsel from Alan and Overy will translate and analyze and turn into a document, which my rule team then turns into actual code, which then gets approved by our client. If somewhere along the way, somewhere make, someone makes an interpretation or a judgment call that that comma meant this or that, Unfortunately, we can't take liability for that. So it remains with the client. But what we do say, as I mentioned, with the, the big circle of banks is the great thing is the more clients we have using the same rules, the likelihood of somewhere a mistake slipping in is going to diminish and diminish towards zero. Whereas if you're doing this on your own, somebody comes in and types a macro in an Excel sheet, does a divide by 100 thing instead of not, and then you suddenly made a mistake, which nobody will catch except you. So I think there it's, it's kind of this, well, you know, liability will always rest with you, but the likelihood of something happening will, will absolutely decrease when you're doing it in a community and sharing knowledge with each other and not trying to, you know, outfox each other. So um, in that respect, yeah, it's, it's uh, certainly if we said it, that the minimum threshold was 99, there was actually one, there'd be a case there, but for certain things for interpretation, as I said, with commas or translations, it's too difficult. A similar story on the advice systems, for example, for MIFIT, to or the upcoming feed like unit suitability rules, making sure the portfolio stays within the risk profile. The client has to sign it off and the liability goes back. But the more clients we have and then we see a problem in the whole thing, we correct it for the entire community. Also, the other thing, he, he, they link the community, but with us we link user groups um, and then there's the discussion how to interpret a certain rule where you need I don't know how you need product risk classification versus portfolio risk and all that. And the community then forms an opinion. And not all the rules from what I see are crystal clear in implementation. And then often the bank practice forms also the regulation practice. And so that's why it's a self-enforcing loop that is beneficial once more banks use the same systems. And I also believe that Adhering to regulation is no added value. You have to do it no matter. And the added value lies, in our cases, in the strategies you formulate, in your product offering, in your digital user interfaces that you design yourself. Okay. Coming to an end, uh, we have heard this morning that the party might be over. So please tell us why the party is not really over or what... Makes. It's only over if you don't do anything. Okay. <laughs> and if you move ahead, it will be a, probably a bigger party, as mentioned, because um, there are enormous opportunities out there if you embrace that. Okay, I would like to thank you very much, gentlemen.